Bro, move that white thing that's behind your microphone. What is it? It's oh, right, behind you. Oh, right your, in front of your you. strap on. Your your strap on right there. What is that it? white thing? Right in front of you. Your right white strap the, on. Right behind the mic, the wind, the windscreen. Oh my. Oh God. wait. Oh, that's not behind you. Oh, it's on the door. Oh. Oh yeah. Sorry. It's it's my daughter's. Uh... No, I don't know what that is. Oh, that's the chair. <laughs> oh. That the microphone sits on. Hold on. Let me get this oh. right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He, hey, behind you. Right. Hold on. There. All right. I know. We're ready. <laughs> Where's that? I was like, what is that? It's like right What's there. That? Is that? I don't see it. <laughs> oh, what? Oh, there goes the vein in the forehead. There it goes. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? I'm one of the hosts with the most, Peanut Tillman, and I got my guy, who's always with me, my trusty sidekick, Roman Deacon Hopper. What's going on, Roman? What's up, Peanut? And you are the host with the most uh, out of me and you. Um, you do have more. You're older than me. Uh, you have more kids. Slightly. Slightly. You have a uh, longer career. Your house is bigger. To sound no, like my, house got... ain't, I don't, my house is only bigger because I have a basement. You live in Carolina, so y'all in Charlotte, y'all don't. Have yeah, we yeah we don't do basements here. But thank you, man, for the introduction as always, man. And uh, you want to let the people know who we got on our guest? Who's our guest? Yeah, today? well, unfortunately, I wasn't able to do this interview, but we uh, had the chance and honor and privilege to uh, have Doug Williams on the show, and he was um, he was phenomenal. I know you did an awesome job. You know, um, this is what you do. You know, you're the Martha Stewart, you're the the Barbara Walters of of these interviews, man. And uh, just hey, how what would you think? What were your impressions of uh, uh, Doug, Mister? Uh, first and foremost, uh, it was a pleasure to have Doug on. Um, you got to understand, growing up in a family that both parents attended HBCUs, he mm -hmm. was part of the Mount Rushmore. I know we like to always ask our guests who's on their Mount Rushmore. He was one of those. Uh, he, Eddie Robinson, Jerry Rice, Walter Payton, the list can go on and on. But Doug Williams being the first uh, African-American quarterback to lead a Super Bowl team, mm. uh, he kind of talked through some of his experience with that, the things that he still holds on to this day. Yeah. And actually him working on a day-to-day -day base, base, uh, basis with the president of the Washington Commanders, Jason Wright, yeah. who formerly uh, of a football player, NFL player himself, now is the president. It's just amazing to see those things and uh, share some of those stories, his aspirations, how he ended up at Grambling, one of the best stories I've ever heard. Um, so, Peanut, man, it was a, it was an honor, and uh, it really meant a lot to have him on. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, without further ado, man, I'm uh, I'm ready to listen to it. So let's uh, let's go and listen to this thing. All right, we got Mr. Doug Williams here, and I just let's just jump right into it, Doug. Um, I'm seeing you with your Washington Commander shirt on. I've seen you in your office. You're Doug, right now, fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. Sorry, excuse me. My life right now is. Well, you know, my life right now, I'm gonna say it's good. You know, um, okay. you know, with I got two girls now that are in in high school playing basketball, and I'm. Come to work every day for the Washington Commanders, man. You can't be in a better situation than that I am in today. So I, I feel pretty good. Okay, well, good, man. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're feeling good. I, I got to be honest with you. I was a little nervous doing this. So, Doug, <laughs> you were growing up. I grew my, my parents both went to and graduated from Alabama State University. So I, I grew up going to all the games, attending everything. And it's like, a, you know, the, the GOAT level of, of where you're at and according to HBCU. It, uh, like lore is real you're up there with you know it's you steve mcnair and, and like jerry rice like you are the man so so thank you for joining us today man it really means the world to me and uh i, I know you've had a lot of second acts you know you're a high school coach you coached at your old alma mater your college alma mater Gr gramlin state and now uh nfl executive with the bucks and commanders uh why has it been important for you to stay connected to the game for all these years well, you know, football has been good to me, Roland, mm -hmm. and um, it's hard not to want to uh, still be a part of it and give back if you got an opportunity to do that. And and that's what I've been able to do and, and thankful to um, uh, football from a college level, high school, and the professional ranks, you know, just to still be in it in itself to me 
it's a, it's it's something that a lot of people uh, didn't have a chance to do, and I'm just glad and thankful that uh, I got a chance to do that. But not only just be here, but to be able to give back. You know, right. being in, yeah. in working for the National Football League and working for the Washington Commanders still give me an opportunity to give back to HBCU. Hmm. You know, from a time standpoint and, and what I do and what we've been doing, me and, and James Harris, Shaq Harris. That is, you know, it's 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 a blessing. Is like your mainstay, your main focus, or sometimes, in, you know, when you're always trying to develop these programs and your thought processes, is it always trying to help to give back to the HBCU? It's like a trickle down effect. Or I think I was fortunate. Um, number one, going to Grambling and, and being coached by a guy by the name of Eddie Robinson. You know, bless yes. So I think I was fortunate enough to, to be able to be around a man for five years with a red shirt year. And saw what he did for, for HBCU and Grambling and giving back and, and what he always talked about, what it meant to him, um, you know, watching young guys grow up and, and being able to go out in America and, and, and support themselves, support the family and things like that. So I always felt it was always my, my duty to give back no matter where I am to to uh, institution and the other institution that allowed me an opportunity to do what I did. And it's, it's such a great feeling uh, when we can do that and, mm -hmm. and give back. And you can see these young guys getting the opportunity. Um, you know, some of them might, like the Legacy Bowl, some of them might play the last football game. But the fact of the matter, we gave them that opportunity. That's a good feeling. Yeah. To give yeah, them yeah. that chance. And, and that's why I, I, I do what I do. And uh, Shaq and, and Harris and I, we talk every day about, about the things that we've been able to do from the HBCU standpoint. So do, do you – like, do they actually come up and thank you personally for that? Because, or they don't even realize that. And you probably don't even want the kudos. You know, it, it's not something we look for, uh -huh. but it's always good to hear. But uh, we was fortunate last last year, um, a, a bunch of guys after it was old with, man, they were so thankful for being able to play in the Legacy Bowl, which they wouldn't have never got a chance to do. We mm -hmm. all know it's going to be two or three guys, maybe four guys from – uh, HBCU, they get a chance playing other All Star games and maybe go to the combine. But for the masses of, you know, we had a hundred guys on with both teams. For the masses, they would never get that opportunity. So a lot of them were so thankful to do that. And and you know, we got we got some help from from some guys like Jamie Winston, you know, and and mm -hmm. and, and um, Armstead, um, Patrick McHome. He came down to the game. You know, which, oh wow in itself says a lot about who he is as a person and what, what he uh, wanted to do is help people. And, and, you know, it was, it was a great day. Nice. So, so let's talk about kind of what are your second acts like right now, what you're doing. So you're, you're working with Jason Wright as a senior advisor. And so I want to know, give me a little bit of info or just insight on how's that relationship and what do you provide for Jason in that role? I, th I think for Jason, you know, being the first, you know, now there, there are three, but being the first African American as a president of National Football League, mm -hmm. uh, I think says a lot. And uh, what Jason did was come in and diversify this whole uh, organization from from that side of the ball. And I thought that in itself was great. You know, men, women, black, Latino, uh, LBGTQ, you name it. it. It wasn't no hold back on who he had. He was looking for the best people to do the job. And he came in and did that. And and every every week or so, you know, myself and and three other people, we sat down and meeting with Jason, and we talk about things that is happening in the city, mm -hmm. around the city, and and things that we do, like for suite owners and and all the other people. You know, we show up and kind of I'm kind of like a sounding board for Jason. Okay, you know, and he always yep. asking me stuff, and I tell him, you know, the the feel and and the things that are going on and what are people saying and the things that you might have to defend and things like that. So that that's basically what I do. And it's not a bad situation because I never knew, you know, being a player and being on the personnel side, these kind of things I didn't even know existed. You know, yeah. I, I knew you had people doing a certain <laughs> job, but it's so much, man, so many fans and the people involved, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. Some of the things you hear. And you know, what else is amazing is that, for as long as you play ball, you never knew how many other people it takes to make something really work. It, it, that's, it, that's, that's the thing that get me. <laughs> we, we got so many people work on his side. And, you know, uh, being in, in, in the building uh, on the personnel side, you didn't get a chance to see that. 
No. Now, on this side, man, it is truly a, a lot of people who work in football that you had no idea work in football, which, which I think is great because you give other people who are not players, who are not coaches, trainers, whatever, an opportunity to work for an NFL team. You know, that is what I, I try and I criticize so many of our young people in today's uh, society with that, you know, they have these goals and aspirations, but their only goal is to, you got to play in the NFL. You got to play in the NBA. You got to play in the WNBA. Instead of saying like, you know, it's a lot of, it's way more jobs working with those or those companies and with those shields than it is actually on the field in front of the camera. So it's, you can still be parts and achieve your goal and be a part of something great like the NFL and have just as much fun and get the same ring. Without the same bad news. And, and, you know, you know what? And, and that is true. You know, I'm fortunate enough. My, you know, my, my son actually is assistant coach with the Saints. Okay. And and I got a daughter who who works for, I hate to say it, it's, it's some people in Dallas. You know, <laughs> <laughs> she, she works for the, for the, for the Cowboys. And, and you know what? They love it. You know, he loved coaching. She loved working on the other side in, in, the, in the community and stuff like that, man. And, it's a blessing for me to see them work because I know what the NFL has done for me and what it do for a whole lot of people is give them an opportunity to 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 work in something that they they love being around. Now, Doug, given the fact that you were a trailblazer yourself for playing quarterback, one of the first African American quarterback, I think you're the first one to win a Super Bowl, if I believe, right? Right. Um, um, if my mind tells me right, and then from there, like. I know it has to be you're a little bit proud and you got to take some kind of pride in working with Jason as he was the first African-American president. And like like you said, you I'm a soundboard. But inside, personally, how does that really make you feel working with him? Like, man, every time we do something right, this is another step in the right direction for for people. Well, you you know what? Them. The most important thing, the fact, number one, Jason played football. Yeah, that's okay. that's the other part. He played seven I didn't years. even know that. I didn't even he played know. seven years in, in, in the NFL. Which to me, you know, he kind of understand the language that you don't have to speak as a player yep. and that fraternity that comes together as a player. So it's a lot easier for me because, you know, Jason give me respect just like I give him respect. I think mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's about two guys who played in the league that can communicate and they understand what what what, what is being said and, and what you're talking about. And the respect is that because we are, we both was players. That, that's really cool, though. And you know what? It is a, a unspeaking language and respect is always earned, never given. So uh, it, it really means a lot to hear that he was also a former player, you know, and continues to divvy out power. How, how is that? Does he just. All right. You're good at this. You go do it. You're good at this. You go do that. And then we all come back and report to each other. You know, trust I you what, teammates, I guess. What is you know, what is that like? No, no you know what? Sitting back, number one. And like I say, I didn't I didn't understand this side of the coin of the ball mm -hmm. from the president's standpoint jason has done an excellent job of finding out what it takes to to run an organization on this side you know ron handles football jason had all the business side and for a guy to transition out of being a player to what jason doing you know to me you know it, it, it opens my eyesight as to yeah. oh it takes all this and jason <laughs> has done that and he know all the facets, and you know, around here in in, in Washington, that there's a lot of fire that has to be put out. <laughs> and, and Jason, for some reason, seemed like the fire department a lot of time because he's putting out a lot of fires, but he also bringing in a lot of things that make this organization uh, a good organization. What a lot of people don't see at this time, but I think if they look at what has transpired in the last two to three years, uh, you got to attribute that to to what Jason Wright has done. I would agree with you on that. I'm not going to even ask you about all those fires he's putting out personally. I'm not going to ask that, but we'll keep it moving. Just know they can Google that for all the listeners. You can Google that. Okay. Ty, early, earlier this year, the team created a Doug Williams diversity coaching fellowship. What is that program? And uh, what do you want to see come out of it? Well, you know, the NFL, um, had a directive that every team in the National Football League has to bring in a young minority intern to to work with the quarterbacks and, and on that oh. side of the ball because it, 
you know, one of the things that we have found out from, from coaches and offensive coordinators and quarterback coaches, there's not a many of them in the National Football League. And they're not going to get there if, you know, if you just depend on the coaches who get jobs to hiring people. That's the worst thing that has happened. And what the NFL is doing now, they they making it possible for that to happen. You bring in a, a minority um, guy to work in the quarterback. And what Ron did here was create a Doug Williams minority internship. And what what I did personally compared to what other people did, they brought in minority. I brought in a minority from HBCU. Uh-huh. You know, the guy that comes with, with my internship going to always be from an HBCU and making sure that they get somebody from HBC to come in and, and work with the, with the coaches, the quarterbacks, the offensive coordinator, and the head coach on, on a professional level. So they may want to be able to learn as much as they could then get an opportunity to coach in the National Football League, to be the quarterback coach, uh, to be an offensive coordinator, and, and eventually hopefully be a head coach. Okay, so like I said earlier, any chance you get, you're going to take it all the way back down to, to where it really started at for you. And I, I love that personal touch that you put on everything that you do, Doug. Um, just a little bit about Ron Rivera. He was my coach at the Carolina Panthers. I love that man. He's a great person, a great heart. Um, I saw that he lost his mom more recently. So shout out to him. Prayers up for him and his family, everything he's going through. But Ron is another guy who literally tries to go out of the way to make sure diversity is included in everything that he does. Him growing up the way that he did, being a Mexican-American football player that he is, he he wears that on his chest and he doesn't shy away from it. Could you maybe talk about that and maybe his experiences or what he shared and, with you? And 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 he and he doesn't shy away from it. And no. he's the one who came to me. <laughs> and um, you know, he he sent his his administrative assistant, he said, Coach wanna see you. So I went down and you know, I had no idea. I knew they had to do it, but mm-hmm. had no idea what he had in mind. And I think it's also you talking about a coach who played the game, uh, you know, played against Ron and all that. Yeah. And it was a respect that he had for for me. And he said, "Hey, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna have an intern. We're gonna name the Doug Williams Internship Fellowship." You know, I said, "Oh, okay." He said, "You're gonna be a quarterback, whatever, and we're gonna give you a chance to get all of the resumes in, and and you read them, you you go over them, and then we we pick three guys, we bring them in, we interview them, and we'll go from there." And lo and behold, man, that was that was a great experience of uh, being in that position. And, and now you got a fellowship name after Doug Williams, which I think to me uh, says a lot about Ron and his organization, yeah. that the respect that um, of Doug Williams. It's not that I'm in Zachary, Louisiana, anywhere away from me. I'm here. Yeah. And for them to do that while I'm here, I, I think it's one of those situations where they say, give you your roses while they, you're here. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's what is happening. <laughs> Man, that's beautiful, though. And, and and so, Doug, you never had a – I mean, probably outside of Eddie Robinson back in your days at Graham State, you never had a black quarterbacks coach. How important or – what do you think that feel is like when you – maybe as a young African-American coach or, or 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 minority player, for you to have a coach or somebody that maybe looks like you or maybe has done some things or has some life experiences, or do you not think that it's important at all? Let, let me say that. I, th- I think, to be honest with you, I think the National Football League – uh, is really missing it. Yeah. You know, what what a, a, a man of color does for a lot of the players that are in the locker room. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just reading the article. I, I forgot. I, I hadn't finished reading it. How many teams in this league has never had a minority coach? And some situations, you know, you see them rehash and bring guys back to this team or that team or what happened. But in some organization, it's meant for African American coach to be the coach there. They they don't the owners don't don't feel it. And most of the owners, a lot of owners don't hire the coach. They they got headhunters or whatever who pick the coach. And you know, I'm not gonna get into how that that happens or what have you. But there's so many teams out there, I feel, that are missing the boat. And then when you got a young African American quarterback, yeah. I'm gonna say this and, and I don't care who who hears it. If you got a young African American quarterback, and then you got a black quarterback coach somewhere, it's it's more than X's and O's, Roman. Roman, it's 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 not just X and O. It's being able to communicate and comfortable communicating with that individual because that's going to be some things that come up during the season, 
uh, that's personal in nature that might be affecting his play. Mm-hmm. That he 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 can talk to somebody else who look like him, who understand him a little more than the guy who's really coaching him. I think they're missing it, missing that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh, well said. I don't even want to try and diminish your words by that because you've been in that seat, you played that position, you know exactly what it's like, and I'm just glad that you yourself, along with Ron, are trying to push that uh, push that narrative uh, to a different place now. That you know we want to see more. Uh, African-American quarterback coaches, not just offensive coordinators, because people don't understand that. They think, oh, man, you just get a coach. Is this? But I'm like, no, well, actually, the hiring process, the way they do it, it starts right there in that quarterback room all the time, all the time. So those are the little back channels that we don't know and more fans should hear about and uh, really get to know and experience a little bit more when you're really doing a deep dive into the NFL locker room and uh, upstairs activities. All right. Another one of your second acts is your support for HBU, HBCUs, which we've talked about three or four different times today already. When you think of your legacy, how much do you want that to be a part of it? Or is it all of it? Well, I, I think, you know, whatever, you know, they, they always say that um, between the time you're born and the time you died, as a dash, that should speak for you, what, what, what it done. And I can't sit here and say what, what that dash says. I think it's the people that you dealt with in life and the people who know what you've done is the, the person, the people who feel in that dash. Mm-hmm. And I can't say here what I want my legacy to be. Uh, I'm fortunate enough, you know, I got eight kids and they all know what I do and they all proud of me and what I've done and, and keep doing. So I think at the end of the day, they would be the one to fill in that dash along with a lot of other people. You know what? Doug, I'm going to say it. Yes, it would. All right. I knew about this man from from his playing days. And not only that, but he was the first to go out there and do it and to win at the highest level where a lot of African-Americans could not play quarterback at the time. They would move you to DB or play you at wide receiver or somewhere else. So I will go out there and say it. It was you. It was Eddie Robinson. And for me, Steve McNair or Jerry Rice. Those are my top guys that came from HBCUs, watching it, growing up in it. And so, Mr. Doug, I will tell you that. I know you don't want me to call you Mr. But, Doug, <laughs> I'm going to tell you it's going to be on there. All right? There we go. All right? There we go. All you right. <laughs> no doubt. So when you created the Black College Football Hall of Fame back in 2009, which, first of all, I want you to tell me that process. How did that come about? Uh, did you envision, like, it would be such a monumental success? Like, like, how could you imagine it from going to nothing to all of a sudden, boom, where we are? Well, you know, couldn't I couldn't see uh, back in 2009 where we are today. Let, let me see. Let me tell you exactly how it all started. James Harris and I, we we had a full, uh, foundation, Williams and Harris Foundation. Mm-hmm. And when Hurricane Katrina came, a lot of kids were moved from New Orleans and all different kind of places. And in Shreveport, Louisiana, they, they moved a bunch of kids. And what me and, and James did, we we gave a uh, hundred kids, we a hundred kids that had been moved out of New Orleans up in Shreveport, and we gave them all a, during the Christmas time a hundred dollar gift certificate that could only be spent on either kids' clothes or toys, which mm-hmm. that eliminate the older people using that hundred dollars <laughs> to get anything they want. So when they went to the cash register, that's the only only thing you can get was kids' clothes, and we we kept the foundation going. We we did uh, tournaments. We raised money. For, for single women who was like in their senior year of college, they was going to graduate. Mm-hmm. We made sure their last semester tuition was paid. We gave them all uh, hot, uh, laptops and things like that. We, we did that a lot, but it was in Shreveport. And then all of a sudden, as, as I traveled and James traveled to certain tournaments and um, charity events and raising money to do other things, so we decided to do that. And I went to Hawaii to June Jones, who, who was doing the benefit over there to play in this golf tournament. And I came back and I said, I'm going to stop in L.A. because James Harris was in L.A. For, for a few days. And the guy that ran June Jones' foundation was over there. And I asked him, would he stop in L.A. with me? And we sat down with James Harris. So he came over. We went to breakfast that morning, and we pitched the, the Black College Football Hall of Fame to him. Now you're talking about a white guy that lives in in in, Arizona, in, in Las Vegas. He don't know nothing about HBCU. Have no idea. 
Yeah. So we tried to tell them how many guys that have gone on to, to HBCU that was great players uh, that had never gotten recognized, how many black college football Hall of Famers in the NFL that was already there that yeah. still had not gotten all their flowers. And he, he said, well, look, let's let's talk about this again in the morning. And that morning he woke up, he came, he said, I got it. So we sat down, and, and from that day on, uh, the Black College Football Hall of Fame was, was, was born. And Arthur Blank, Arthur Blank and, and, and John PR, a payment system in Atlanta. You know, I, I got always give those guys credit because yeah. Arthur Blank was, was one of our biggest sponsors, along with John PR. And it says a lot about Arthur Blank because he saw a vision. And the first three times we had the event in, in Atlanta, we had it at different hotels at that time because we was we was trying to establish ourselves. Arthur Blank came to all three, and he sat there. After one of them, the first one was over, you know, he sat there, and I went to thank him for, for, for his support. And he told me, he said, I could sit here all night and look at the video. He said, I had no idea these guys went to HBCU. <laughs> and 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 that is true because a lot of people don't know a lot of guys that are, that have played in the National Football League that are NFL Hall of Famers and things like that had gone to HBCU and now we got to the point now where we still have a dinner but we have it at the College Football Hall of Fame in Atlanta yep. but we're gonna be housed in Canton, Ohio, which to me that was the thing that, that the straw that broke the camera back was to be able to be in Canton, Ohio, yeah. the National Football League. Uh, Dave Baker, who was who was the executive director of the Hall of Fame at one time, uh, called me and Shaq on. We was on 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 the three way, and he the one that asked us, "Had we thought about moving it, the housing part of the Black College Football Hall of Fame to Canton?" And that was no way. That was a no brainer. I said, oh, yeah, before he even got it out of his mouth. Yeah. And now we're going to be in Canton. And as you know, they, they're doing a whole lot of um, work in Canton, re refurbished the whole thing, and we're going to be housed there. And the reason we he, he decided to do that is because the history, the history of HBCU, he says, is so important to the National Football League and football as a whole that he felt like it was only great to be housed in, in Canton, Ohio. Uh, so I didn't know that it got housed in Canton, Ohio. And that just has to be, it's really cool to say, like, I had this one vision to take us through that whole story. You know, coming from June Jones, who really lit it up out there with the run and shoot out there in Hawaii. If people don't know, I played against them. <laughs> and then from there, a guy with, from Las Vegas gives you the, helps you guys put all this thing together, you and James Harrison. And and now this is what we got. And to be able to recognize all these great players. I was just on earlier with one of our producers, Thomas Warren, talking about how many of the NFL greats all went to HBCUs in the 60s and early 70s. Like that was the only place you could get recognized. Let, let me let me say this. Walter Payton came out, I think, in, in, in the 75 draft, I think. Mm -hmm. In that draft, Jackson State had nine players <laughs> that were drafted. <laughs> Really? Reverend had eight. So it kind of tell you where where all the, the, the black guys went to school. Was, was that in the SWAC conferences? No, when you think about Jackson State, Raul Brazil, Walter Payton, and Jackie Slater. That's not talking about all the other players. All those guys was on that same team in 1974 where I got an opportunity to play against as, as a freshman at Grambling. You know, so just think about what they did for the National Football League. In yeah. their playing days, coming from HBCU, so that was a lot of history that has never, still hadn't been recognized, you know, for for what they've done uh, in the National Football League and what they did as a college player at the HBCU. So, how much pride do you take now that it's in Canton? Man, you know, it's kind of take your breath away because what it does, what I'm here now, I may be going on. It's going to always be the HBCU Black College Football Hall of Fame, and it's going to be able to recognize the guys that a lot of us didn't know, but their family and all the other people around knew that they went to those colleges, and they're getting recognized. It's, now, that's what you call giving guys flowers. Some yeah. of them are still here. Some of them are going on, but they get flowers before they leave. That's that's so critical, though, you know, and for them, not only for them, but then also their their families. 
to be that, able to That's the most that. important thing, they family, man. Get a chance yeah. to, to recognize that whoever, my uncle, my dad, my cousin or whatever, what he did at that institution. Yeah, I, I love that. Thanks, Doug, for sharing all that with us. All right, so how do we maintain this wave of recognition and support for that HBCUs, uh, especially in how much they've gotten over the last three to four years? So it's not just a flash in the pan, but something that really sticks and stays for a long time. That's that's an interesting um, dynamic, you know, and, and let me say this. And go back to, to Dion. Dion going to Jackson State brought so much visibility to HBCUs. And the most important thing here that I've I've said this that what if Dion get a job at a Power Five school? Hopefully he does because he deserve it. You know, do we still keep that visibility, or does yeah. he leave and go with Dion? That's that's a that's a great question. And hopefully the people who support HBCUs during the last couple of years with Dion will continue to do that. And, and we as the graduate of HBCU, we got to do the same thing. Yeah. And I think that's the most important part of this whole situation. It is the ones that's the alumni. The alumni has to continue to keep up with it. And my mom and dad talk about that all the time, trying to continue to support Alabama State the way that they do, uh, whether it's buying a suite, always showing up for different alumni events. You got to show up and you got to show up in your wallet too, man. That's so important. Um, that's, that's big. Yeah. And, and the visibility part, I, I want to see how do we keep that going? Because it, it's not just Dion. Dion is his own thing. Dion has a brand. <laughs> he has a brand. I mean, he's prime time. Like he is prime time. And he's been that way as a coach. He's coach prime. And, you know, he's on commercials with Nick Saban. So, He's there. And it, how did we continue to carry this thing? We don't lose it. We don't want to go backwards. I know we got Eddie George and, and um, what was the former uh, coordinator for the Bengals and coach of the we, we got You got Eddie Robinson in, in Alabama State right now. Yeah, Eddie he's Robinson in Alabama State. He was really good, too. He, you know, And that was great. I know he kind of, he and Dion kept a little words, you know what I mean? With uh, He ain't swag, but um, <laughs> trust me, my family was highly involved in all this. They they have their own emotions about yeah. it. I thought, I think any, sometimes any drama is good for TV. So oh, um, yeah. it, it's good. Um, but um, how do we continue to not lose this and go backwards? Well, number one, I think we got to be real with ourselves. And, and I am. Um, and like you said about, about Dion, Dion, from the day Dion stepped in, the NFL, he's been prime time. And, and, and that's not going to change. And, and I admire him for who he is and, and what he's done. But we all know the visibility in Jackson, Mississippi, is because of Dion. Yeah. You know, it, 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 Jackson is benefiting from it. Don't get me wrong. Jack State has been benefiting from it. But And that's why I ask, if he leave there, where would it go? So we got to be true to ourselves and understand that we – as guys or ladies, whoever who graduated from HBCU, got to be the one to help HBCU carry on without a prime time. Because as long as prime there, they're gonna get the visibility. You know, think about it. how many how many ex athletes that he brought into to Jackson State. That don't happen at every every other school. You know, Michael Strahan. You got Troy Aikman. You you got everybody who stopped in the Jackson. But nobody stopped in the Houston, Texas Southern. Nobody stopped in Huntsville, Alabama. Nobody up in up, up in uh, uh, Mississippi Valley, you know. But but how we get that to spread around to HBCU is the most important thing. Yeah, and I, I don't have that answer, but it's so true. I mean, he got Mike Zimmer working for him as like an and I'm like Zim is a what? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it, it, it's almost unfair. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, but it's true. Um, it, it, it's it's such a weird thing, but it's so not weird because of who we're talking about, and that's Deion Sanders. And, and Coach Prime has done an amazing job. I hope this continues, this wave of love and visibility continues to spread amongst the HBCUs. And so um, I got to tell you this. So for a kid from Zachary, Louisiana <laughs> – which I don't even know where that is exactly. Is it closer to Shreveport? Well, let me say, you played in New Orleans. Let me tell you where it's at. I, I you like, know where Baton Rouge is, right? I do know where Baton Rouge it's is. It's 20 minutes north of Baton Rouge. Oh, really? That's not far at all. You're talking about Zachary Baker, Baton Rouge. We right there. 
<laughs> Didn't even know that. Yeah. That's how small it must be that small. Oh, uh, it's one of those towns that uh at one point it, it's grown a lot since Hurricane Katrina. Okay. Matter of fact, it got his own school system now. Zach got it, it broke away from East Baton Rouge Parish. Okay. But it was so small they had welcome to Zachary and, and come again on the same sign. That's how small it was <laughs> <laughs> when I was youngster. We had one caution light. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like my dad's hometown. Oh, man, that's hilarious. Okay. From Zachary, Louisiana, you come a long way, wouldn't you say? Just give me an overall synopsis of like. You know what? You know, when we won the Super Bowl here in 1988, 87th season, I uh, went to the White House and I was standing up there with uh, President Reagan. And the one word I said to myself, I said, it's a long ways from Zachary, Louisiana <laughs> to be on stage with the president of the United States, man. And the good part about it, it's um, we talk about it all the time. Me and Shaq, we always talk about the road that was less traveled, how, how, I, how we both got a chance to get to a point where we was being successful in the National Football League and all the things that you had to uh, endure and, and how you get there. And no matter how many times you got knocked down, Coach Rob used to always tell us, it ain't about getting knocked down, it's about getting up. Every time It's getting up off the turf. And and I think about that and, and, and all the things that we had to go through during the civil rights time and all that, that never bothered me. I didn't, I didn't realize uh, until I got older what, what that really was and you look back on it. But as an athlete, you know, you're involved in athletics, you're playing baseball, football, all that in high school, all the way to college. Uh, a lot of things didn't even didn't even hit you, didn't even resonate. And then you realize what so many other people was dealing with and you dealt with it and didn't know what was happening. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I always it's, it's come back to what my dad used to always say, it's water up under the bridge. So I never looked at it or took it to heart when somebody say something about me. And like I was, when I was playing National Football League, there was so many commentators, man, made derogatory statements and things like that because they had never seen a black quarterback and, and they, they couldn't get used to it. I know when I was in Tampa, every article, you know, that was written was either Doug Williams, Tampa's black quarterback, or Tampa Bay's black quarterback, you know, so because they had never gotten used to it, which the daytime is a little different. Nobody talk about the color of the quarterback now. It's, it's, no. it's about the quarterback. And like I told him, in the next five, six to ten years, half of this league going to be black quarterbacks, you know, when you look at yeah. it realistically. So nobody worry about that. That adjective right now don't even resonate. It's the, the person who's in those positions. And I'm glad to be able to come through all that to get to this point. That that's what it's all about now. It, it's not about the color of your skin. It's, it's the character and, and whether or not you can play the position. And so when you look back on all that, like, do you appreciate it now? Because when you're going through it, you don't ever appreciate the good old days. Like, you never do. You, so you know I what? Hear, I, I appreciate I it more than ever that. at yeah. this stage. At yeah. this stage, I do. Because I remember playing Little League Baseball. I, I was looking at a picture the other day of me playing Little League Baseball. And all the things I had to come through, I played. I was uh, me and the guy named Sherman Floyd was the first two guys to integrate. Now this is the shame, the shame part about it. My oldest brother was our coach to integrate American Legion baseball in in 1973 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We were the first two blacks to ever play American Legion baseball, and we we played in the game out in Denham Spring. And, and I know you played in, in, in New Orleans, but you might not understand what Dennis Frame was. That's where David Duke, the Grand Dragon, lived in Dennis yeah. Frame, which okay. was about 30 miles, 35 miles from my hometown. And we had to play out there one night. And, you know, we were the only two blacks in the stadium. And, and my dad was probably the only black in the stand. And my brother was the only black coaching. And some of the words and some of the things that were said back then, and, and, you know, my brother in the dugout used to always say, don't worry about it, Doug. Just, just show them what you are, who you are. And, you know, and I went up and had a couple of triples and a double and things like that. And he always told me, he said, hey, they can call you whatever you want. But, dude, you don't look at it that way. You just play your game. And I learned to be able to overcome things like that at, at an early age, man. And I think it helped me to where I am today. Well, Doug, it clearly has uh, been water under the bridge for you, and it's clearly shown that all it has done is allowed you to continue to grow and be above it all, man. And it's a it's a pleasure 
to have been sitting down and listening to all these answers. So we got to pay some bills. I got like you. Peanut always says, we got to pay these bills. And we'll take a break real quick. And uh, we'll be back with more Doug Williams. Thank you. All right, Doug, we, we, this last little segment here, we just got like a whole bunch of questions. We just first come, like whatever comes to your mind, throw it out there. That's what we like to do. Put you on the hot seat for a second and see how it goes. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. What are, I can't wait for this answer. What are your two or three favorite quarterbacks to watch in today's game? Quarterback? Yeah. Wow. Lamar Jackson, without a doubt. Oh, I, I agree that he's Lamar Jackson it would, would be one of my one of my favorite quarterbacks. Wow. Just just what he does, yeah. and, and the fact that people say he he shouldn't be a quarterback, he should be a wide receiver or whatever. And you know, last I checked, quarterbacks aren't charged with throwing TD passes, and and he and he does that. Yeah, you know, the kid was blessed with so much talent that people can't really see. Because his talent overtakes what they're looking at. Yeah. So Lamar right. Jackson would be there, and the, the kid up in Buffalo, Josh Allen, man, he 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 plays the game with I don't give a damn attitude. Uh, yes, and, he does. And, yes, I, and I think that's the way that's the way it should be played. With with I don't give a damn attitude. I play to win, and I think that's that's the most important thing. And you know, I, I got to say this. I know he's old. He's been around a long time. But Tom Brady, you know, to me, I know they haven't played well over the last few weeks, but just watching him from a fundamental standpoint, it's very seldom that he does anything wrong when he's throwing the ball, his posture and everything. It's always the same thing. Fundamentally, yeah. I like Tom Brady as, as, as the guy, man. So those, those three guys that, for me, I love looking at, but there's a lot of guys around, you know, that I, I like looking at. And Patrick Mahomes, who what shit, what can he say? <laughs> I mean, the other night I'm still trying to figure out, you know, you give him a you give him a minute and 35 seconds on the clock and he give you 25 seconds back. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to me, that's, that's how old <laughs> And he does it all the time. It, 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 it's not an accident. That's the <laughs> thing about it. It ain't accidental. No. This is this is a routine, you know. He, he so if, if you playing Patrick, that. you got a chance to score to win, and he's down by six. You know, you let the clock run out, man. Don't score yet, cause it, it ain't good for you. <laughs> it's crazy that that's how it's become, but yeah. it re he really has become that good. Um, oh, unbelievable! A quarterback that you mentioned that I would probably hate playing against is definitely Josh Allen because his ability to be able to throw the ball that way he does. But, but and he's like 6'4", 230, and trying to run over people all that, the time. That's that's what I'm saying. He don't play, he don't play the game with no caution as a quarterback. He don't have caution in his head. No, he don't understand. He's the quarterback. They can't afford to lose you. He no. don't care. No, he's trying to run you over and jump <laughs> over you. They're running quarterback sweeps. I'm like this next level of quarterback play. I agree. I think the NFL is in such a good place. When it comes to young quarterbacks in this NFL right now, it's just it's a lot of star power, lots and lots of star of power at mm -hmm. that position. Thank you for that. All right, next question: What's the biggest thrill getting into the Hall of Fame yourself, or creating the Black College Football Hall of Fame? Well, to be honest with you, creating this this Black College Football Hall of Fame, you know, getting into getting into the Hall of Fame is, is out of my hand, out of my control. I can't do anything about okay. that. Great point. But but I, but what we're doing is, is creating the Hall of Black College Football Hall of Fame. I can put my hands in that. So for for me, that's what it's all about at this particular time, man. Um, you know, making sure people that deserve an opportunity to be in here get their flower. That that's and it, and it's not about me. It's about making sure that they get what they deserve. Yeah, I I love that, and I knew you would say that though. As soon as you know, as we've had this conversation, because how much pride you take into that whole thing. And the story was awesome. So uh, it, it was really worth it. All right. Now we're going to bring up a picture here for you on the next question. I, I hope you can see this. How much money would Doug Williams command in today's NFL? All right. We got top five quarterback contracts um, that we're looking to pull up here. 
right? <laughs> if you can, I'm going to read them off for you. And then I want you to tell me your number. Okay, okay. here we go. <laughs> All right. Number one, Patrick Mahomes, total value, $450 million. Average about 45 a year. Josh Allen is at $258 million. He's averaging about $43 million a year. Russell Wilson, $245 million, about $49 a year on average. Kyler Murray, $230 and a half. Uh, I say half like it's a little bit of money. $230 million and $500,000. With an average of about $46 million a year. And Deshaun Watson, who hadn't played in two years. Two hundred thirty million with about another forty six million in average. All right, Doug, throw yourself in that hat. Where are you at on where? To, how much you think you would need? First of all, let me say this: I was born too soon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell my son that all the time, man. It's it's amazing where where this is gone, and I, I do believe, you know, if I was in this time uh, in the offense that these guys played in, you remember yeah. I played in Tampa five years. And you wouldn't, you you might not remember, but we had two backs and tight end and two wide outs. And our <laughs> wide outs got down with on, on the three-point stand. That's, and we was running the ball right, left, pitch right. So all these innovative offense today, if I had not had an opportunity to play in those type of offense, uh, I would probably be in, in those numbers. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You know, Josh, Josh Allen plays a little bit like me. Yeah, I play a little. I was playing a little bit like Josh, you okay. know, because what I did was made sure we was in position to win. You know, I didn't believe in taking sacks. Uh, I would throw the ball away. I did things that would help the team. Yep. And I think at the end of the day, I, I would have been somewhere in those numbers. You, you know, Doug, I tell myself that all the time. Like, dude, I blame my parents. If I was born like, like, literally eight years later, like it would be, I'd be a totally different like level, total different <laughs> level. It's crazy. The contracts and one of my former teammates when I first got in the league, he told me, he said, "Look, hopefully you're blessed and get play. You get to play long enough when you get your first big deal, you're gonna love your numbers, and you play long enough when you see somebody sign for it. Like their signing bonus is gonna be bigger than your whole contract. That's what happens." And I'm like, oh, and, and, and no question for me. <laughs> I mean, the, the the guy at the bottom of the totem pole beats my contract. <laughs> Oh, that's so good and so true. The money y'all were making back then. Crazy. Unbelievable. Okay. All right, last question here. And this is something we ask every one of our guests on here. And you got to understand it's only four. So who is on your personal Mount Rushmore? Jeez. Some yeah. people have their parents. Some people don't. Some people say, you know, but it's it's yours. How many, how many people we can have up there? Mount Rushmore has got four. Four. Woo. Jesus, I you know I would I would have to say my my first three are gonna be my mom and dad and Coach yep. Robinson and my oldest brother. There it is. I love that personal touch. People that yeah. have really been with you since day one. And ain't no ain't no doubt about it. You know, it's nothing else I can say. Uh, when you talk about Rush Mount Mount Moore, Rushmore, what people mean to you. That, that's me. That's those four people right there mean the world to me. Well, well, well thanks for that, Doug, man. Uh, I appreciate that. Here's one more personal question I want to know. Um, what was it like to be recruited by Eddie Robbins? <laughs> Let me tell you how that happened, though. <laughs> okay. I want to know. Like this, I, I, don't, I don't know anybody. Let me tell me. You know, in, you know, in 1973, black quarterbacks wasn't, wasn't really playing in the SEC. Uh -huh. it, it only be it only been one black quarterback in the SEC, and that was Kendrick Holloway. Yeah, from Tennessee. Tennessee. Yep. And even in the SWC with Texas and all, there wasn't no black quarterback. So I was I was only recruited. Went to a small school up in Zachary, Cheneyville High School, recruited by Jackson State, Southern University, Grambling, Mississippi Valley, Tennessee State, and Jackson. Them was, them was my teams that recruited me, and being from being from Zachary, Southern University, is only twenty minutes from my house. Yeah. So I really wanted to go to Southern because I felt like it would give my parents an opportunity to come to the game. Yep. You know, and Coach Rob at that time, you wouldn't know anything about this, but we had a party line on our telephone. Okay. We had 12 parties on our line. So <laughs> Coach Rob called the house late one night, about 12 o'clock or so. I'm asleep. And he talked to my mom. And my mom came in and she woke me up. She said, hey, you going to Gremlin? <laughs> 
said, you going to Grambling? I said, why you say that? She said, I just got off the phone with Coach Robinson. And he said, you're going to go to class, you're going to go to church, and you're going to graduate. And <laughs> that's the best decision my mom ever made, man. <laughs> so, so, hold on. So, Doug Williams, his whole career, he had nothing to do with, like, your mama came, woke you up and said, you go, you go to Grambling. And, and, that's the, and that's the honest God truth. You know, that's but back so then, you respect your parents. She said, you going? What you going to do? You going. That's where I'm going. You going. It, that's... <laughs> That's so good because as I was going through my recruiting process, my mom told me, look, I need you to stay in the state of Alabama because your brother just went to Troy. So this, you can just cut all the other stuff out. Like it's all these other schools here. You just pick one. You good? I was like, okay, do what your mama said, right? That's the same thing. I was like, Ain't no all argument. right. <laughs> Ain't no argument. <laughs> I mean, that's great that that's how you ended up at Grambling State University. I hope more people hear this because – that's why you got to listen to your mama right there. Hey, man. Mama knows best. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Well, I'm going to let you get up out of here, man. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor having you on today on the NFL Players Second Acts podcast. Thank you so much, Doug Williams, and uh, appreciate you for stopping by. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate you. And tell, and tell Peanut we missed him. <laughs> I, I will definitely do that, man. Right. Definitely, man. Some stuff came up in his family. He had to step in, so. All right. Hey, Rome, you did your thing on that one. Thanks, dog. That was that was dope. That was that was real nice, man. Um, yeah, he was. That was that was just awesome. I, that was that might have been one of your best ones right there. That was that was Oprah. You've graduated from Barbara <laughs> to Oprah. That was that Oprah quality right there. You know what I'm saying? That was that was a good one. But you know, Peanut, I appreciate that, man. And uh, it really meant the world for, for Doug to kind of stop by. We did miss you on that one, just your your charisma, your spontaneity, uh, just being right on time as always. But just know, man, it meant the world for him to come out here and also the timing of it. Literally talking about Doug going into the aspects of being leading HBCUs into the next right. era, understanding that the urgency that HBCUs need to work with right now, understanding that Dion was not going to be there forever. And lo and behold, he's hired to Colorado seven days later. Before, Ain't that awesome? Right after we did. It's crazy. It's awesome, too. We should celebrate it. Not everybody should be angry. That's what Doug talked about. Take it upon ourselves to continue to grow this game. We can't depend on one sole person to do it. It right. was never going to work that way. So hats right. off to him and hats off to everybody that will continue to push this thing forward. Now, Thank you guys for all those listeners out there for tuning in. I ask you to spread the word and to give us a rating, a review, and a follow on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. We out of here. <laughs>